A group of scientists are currently on a journey to the end of the world in hope of finding answers about our planet's future. And our science correspondent, Martin Stew, is with them on board the RRS Sir David Attenborough. He is, in fact, the only journalist on board. This week, he's spoken to prime ministers. There has been no change in what your government is doing. Well, I, I don't accept that. I think we're making... Uh, the necessary adaptations but look is it a challenge um, of course it is he's spotted whales and even seen penguins we have a lot to talk to him about so let's crack on i'm lucy watson and this is what you need to know Hello there, Martin. It's great to see you again. I see that you've upped your game a bit. The backdrop behind you is slightly more ship-like than the, uh, the the one when I spoke to you last week that looked a bit like an office. What's going on outside? Is it rain? Is it snow? What's happening? Yeah, I don't know how much you can see behind me. It is snow. We've tried to light it in the spotlights of the ship behind me. So when I spoke to you last week, we were on the station itself on the land, and now we've come back onto the ship. So we're currently parked in front of the front of a glacier, sort of a 50 metre high wall of ice. Uh, and what the ship is doing as it's moving along slowly is mapping how deep the floor is underneath. So that's what they're doing at the moment. How has this week been for you? You must be really settled in yes. now, actually. It's, it's what's quite strange, because we were here sort of the week before we started broadcasting on Monday. That was Manic running around filming. And then this week has been Manic turning all the pictures into bits of TV to go out there running around doing lives. I mean, the ship is, is deceptively big. So we sleep in a cabin down on the third floor. Where I'm at the moment is the observation deck on the 10th floor, which is where it's often easiest to do some of the lives from. So poor old Mike, the cameraman, has been running up and down. It's 104 steps, we've counted, uh, with all the equipment, plugging it in. The guys on the ship have been amazing. We, we use Starlink, which is the system that kind of looks and picks up the satellite system. We've got one, the ship's got one. We're trying to kind of combine the signals and to make sure that it doesn't blow off the roof of the ship, they've milled it and stitched it on and we're trying to make the technology work. So it's, it's been really busy, um, but it's been great. And the reaction to the sort of scale of ambition we've been able to shine a spotlight on the climate issue has been really good as well. So a real team effort, not just you and Mike, but the crew on board have been helping ITV. <laughs> Yeah, everyone. I mean, we did a live the other day from a lab. We had, obviously, the scientists were in there doing the science, but we had the lab manager holding the cables behind us so we didn't trip over as we went over the icy steps. You know, it's, it's a real... Everyone's involved. Now, I know we talked last week about some of the wildlife that you've spotted. Um, so just tell me a bit about this week. What a, I know that you, uh, you saw an emperor penguin, but he was all alone. Is that right? What's significant about that? I, well... Yeah, I and mean, I think he was a bit lost, that one. He oh, was right. 30 <laughs> kilometres from, from his mates. Apparently, you, re you occasionally do get them there. The significance was, though, and it's quite a sort of sad report that came out on Tuesday from British Antarctic scientists who are actually based in Cambridge. But the issue for emperor penguins, and they're, they're the really big ones, so you think happy feet, they're the iconic ones, stand on the ice with the dad, with the, the, the chick under the brood pouch. But they need to be on sea ice for the breeding, mm. and it needs to stay stable for about eight months because if it breaks up too early before the chicks can swim, they drown. So it's like, it, that's the real worry as we're seeing sea ice breaking up. But because they live in such remote places, it's really hard to know exactly how they're doing. So what this scientist back in Cambridge has been doing is looking at satellite images, and it's quite unpleasant, actually, but what you can do is see the staining of penguin poo quite clearly from space. <laughs> because let me tell you, when you're up close to penguins, they smell quite funky. And this brown stains gives you an indication of the size of the colony and where they are. Mm. And they'd previously done this work and they'd looked all around Antarctica. And they'd seen that over a 10 year period, the number of penguins had gone down nine and a half percent because of a loss of sea ice largely. Yeah. And they've looked again at a section, sort of the northwest of Antarctica. And in that section, which is where about 30% of the world's emperor penguins live, mm. they've seen that now, rather than over 10 years, but over 15 years, mm. the numbers have gone down 22.5%. So oh, it's that, even worse. That's quite than a jump. Fear. Yeah, it's quite a jump. And, and so what they're now doing is seeing whether that trend is mirrored around the other sort of segments of Antarctica. And if it is, then the sad you know, thing is that actually this species could be close to extinction by the end of this century. Um, and talking at dinner last night with some of the scientists on board, you realise sort of geopolitics is slightly getting in the way because mm. no one 
owns Antarctica. You have to have buy-in from all the different countries who are involved in sort of science Antarctica if you want to get any laws changed or make any differences. And if you have just one dissenting voice, nothing can change. And you can probably guess who the dissenting voices often are, yeah. China and Russia. And one of, the, one of the things they've put on the table is to basically have like a protection order. I can't remember the exact words they use, but essentially saying, yeah, the emperor penguin should be a designated protected species. And everybody said yes, except the Chinese. And so therefore it's vetoed and they can't get that through. Now, how much difference that one policy would make, I don't know, because obviously you've got to tackle the, the larger warming climate issue. But it's just a small issue of like the, the challenges in politics as well as science is going on down here. Um, penguins aside, what else have you seen? I know you saw whales last week. I'm guessing you've seen... Well, that on, on the flip side, I suppose, you know, we were talking there about the, the emperor penguins and that being a very obvious negative. The, some of the mm. whales are, are making a comeback to this area that you're in. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So I think I mentioned last week that one day we saw 115 humpback whales, and we, you know, we saw one yesterday just off the starboard side as we as we were preparing for a live to talk about whales. So I was like, oh great, they're still there. <laughs> uh, but what's great is you know they they were they were you know really really badly hunted in the whaling industry. I think 27,000 were killed in the first half of last century. Whaling bans came in sort of at different times, largely between the 60s and the 80s. And since then, numbers have been coming back up. It takes quite a while because whales live for a long time, so population doesn't just sort of bounce back straight away. But the humpbacks are now nearly back to what they were before the whaling industry was done at scale. So that's amazing, and you see them all around, and it's fantastic. There and is does that recovery kind though, of... This... Can that recovery kind of continue, Martin? Yeah, I mean, they're probably getting back close to the levels where actually they should be. And, and if there's too many more, then they kind of outcompete each other and there's other issues. But there's also this sort of tension, again, with, with humanity, because increasingly people are fishing for krill down here. Krill are like... I, I'm going to describe them as a small prawn. The scientists would kill me. They're somewhere between plankton and a different sort of crustacean. So they're, they're relatively small, mm. um, but they are what humpbacks eat. On a feeding day, humpbacks can eat about one and a half tonnes of krill in a day. I mean, it's a lot. Yeah. Um, but fishermen want to get them as well because the krill can be used to feed uh, farmed fish that we buy in the supermarket and also produce supplements, you know, sort of omega-3 yeah, supplements, yeah. that sort of thing. So there is a, there's a demand for it. Um, and what we're seeing at the moment is there's a couple of marine protection areas around Antarctica, but there's lots more that they want to put in place. But again, international politics is stopping those areas be ratified. So what's happening is you're increasingly getting clashes between the whales and the ships that want to have the krill. And we need to get a way to make sure that there's enough for everybody and you're not all in the same area, if that makes sense. There is a lot of krill, but yeah. you don't want everybody to be in the same spot. So that's one thing they're looking at. And then the other thing, just to depress you slightly further, Lucy, um, <laughs> and we talked about microplastics before, 60% um, of the krill that British Antarctic Survey scientists looked at had microplastics inside the krill itself mm. from things like fishing nets. You know, when we wash clothing, probably like this, which has got like some nylon stuff in, it gets into the water course. And because krill is the bottom of that food web, everything that eats the krill from, you know, penguins to seals to whales, the microplastic parts is up the chain. So let's leave the wildlife momentarily and move on to some different beasts. You have been chatting to a fair few mm. world leaders this week. Among them, our very own Prime Minister, Sir Keir Starmer. What did he have to say? 18 years ago, the last time ITV News came down here, we had a massive crew. I think they had to ship a satellite down especially. But they did a live interview with Tony Blair when he was stood in Downing Street. And... Then Mark Austin, who was the person who'd come down here at the time, he asked Tony Blair about climate change and he said it is the biggest long term threat to humanity. And he also said the cost of not acting on climate change is greater than the cost of taking action. But I don't know if you remember a couple of weeks ago, Tony Blair then wrote a, a forward to some report about net zero in which he seemed to sort of change his tune slightly, saying that net zero needs to be rethought from a political standpoint, essentially because it's economically expensive and is difficult to sell to the electorate. So it seems like there's been a bit of a gear change with him. So I was really keen when I got a chance to talk to the current Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, to find out exactly where he stands and if he 
has also changed in the way Tony Blair mm. has or whether he's still completely committed to that net zero thing. You're in Antarctica at the moment doing great stuff. I have to have seen some of the footage, which has been quite incredible um, and shocking. But um, thank you for doing what you're doing. But what about preparation back at home? The Climate Change Committee not long ago said uh, we are not appropriately prepared for the effects of climate change. They said there has been no change in addressing the risk with the change in government. Are you doing enough? Yeah, I think we are. I think there's been a massive change. If you look at what used to be a cross-party consensus on net zero, unfortunately, that's breaking down. Um, and I do think um, this is a real tragedy. Because... But that's, that, that, that's net zero. We're talking about adaptation here, the ability to cope with it. And that's where the Climate Change Committee is very clear that there has been no change in what your government is doing. Well, I, I don't accept that. I think we're making uh, the necessary adaptations. But look, is it a challenge? Um, of course it is. Uh, but we have to rise to that challenge. Did you feel like he answered your question properly there? Slightly skirted it on the adaptation point. So th there's sort of two things with climate. One is um, stopping more greenhouse gases, so you stop the problem getting even worse. And the second is making sure you're prepared for the changes which are already happening and are already baked in and going to continue happening in the future. That's the sort of mm. adaptation thing. And this big report by the Ch Climate Change Committee a month or so ago said that um, we're not doing very well. And uh, the number of houses which will be at risk of flooding by 2050 will be uh, 8 million different homes around the UK, lots of farmland, lots of railway tracks, lots of roads, and that more thought needs to be put into this. And then you've got the second half, which is that sort of stopping it in the first place, because for other countries like the Bahamas, it's very difficult for the adaptation because their islands are so low-lying that lots of them are going to end up underwater. And as well as Keir Starmer, we've got a chance to talk to the, the Prime Minister of the Bahamas, who's been a very strong voice on the need for world action. Mm -hmm. um, and I just sort of wanted to start asking him, like, from a personal perspective, how worried he is. Uh, uh, terribly concerned. The science, I think, by 2050 or thereabouts, uh, more than 80% more than, um, of my land mass may be underwater. What would you say to those people out there who are sceptical that human activity is having an impact on climate? I'd, I'd just invite them to come and visit the Bahamas. I can show them the impact and the effect of Dorian, Hurricane Dorian. World leaders would have to come together. You know, and for me, I, I, I'm worried because if nothing happens, you know, again, my country, we as Bahamians will be doomed to, uh, you know, to become doomed to a watery grave or become uh, climate refugees. I mean, he's very evidently concerned. And I know that later on in, in your chat with, with the Prime Minister, he too talked about his worries, about the enthusiasm, the commitment from other nations and countries. I even wrote it on my phone. That's why I'm looking at it, Martin, now, because I, when I watched that interview, I, that's what I, I kind of picked up on. And you did find it quite a, quite a challenge to push him, to, to get him to say very much at all on Donald Trump's position. But like, the, the Prime Minister of, um, of the Bahamas says there, you know, you've got to witness it to understand and to grasp exactly what you're doing, I suppose, at the moment, Martin. Yeah, exactly. And, and you need leadership. What, what I took away from the interview with the Prime Minister of the Bahamas is that he, he's kind of taking a very realist perspective. And, and he's realised that trying to make other countries do things for altruistic reasons... There's lots of talk, there has been at lots of different meetings and nothing really has changed. And so you need to sell it to people as this is the cost, it is good value for you, you know, money talks to make these changes. And that you know, climate migration point he made at the end of the clip really struck me from Rachel's report because there was a guy there and he said, you know, if we lose our home, all of a sudden you have got, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people who need a new place to live. And you can see that potential tension, those sorts of tensions playing out around the world because climate is going to be one of the key things that causes mass migration uh, over the next century or so. What have been your standout moments from this week then, Martin? Just, you sort of forget where you are because you're working <laughs> in a laptop and then you look out the window and you think, oh, oh, look, there's a giant iceberg that we're just navigating around. Or you're lying <laughs> in bed and you hear the the engine fire up and a clunk and you realise that they've had to quickly... Re you, you can't put an anchor down here when you sort of park up at night because icebergs move surprisingly quickly. So they have to sort of... It's a bit like Frogger. Do you remember that old computer game? They have to sort of 
crab sideways to dodge large bits of ice as they're moving along. And you see these things. And then another real highlight was, um, as I said last week when we were on the station, after I, just shortly after I spoke to you last time, I got to go out with the field guides. So behind every scientist that's down here is a massive team of engineers, cooks, safety people, you know, everything you need to make life possible down here. And the field guides are the ones who are responsible for getting the scientists to where they need to be. And it's often quite dangerous, quite difficult, but also lots of fun because you're basically getting crampons on, uh, you've got harnesses. So we went out, we were all roped up and we walked up. Did this you feel like Shackleton this week at certain points then? I, f I felt pretty cool. Yeah, I felt pretty, pretty, pretty rock star. And we were going up this big, big hill with the crampons on. You've got the amazing orangey skies over the fjord below you. And then we get to the top. And we had to go across what they call the traverse, which is where they get to lots of the scientific equipment where they need to be. But what's happening is the glacier is moving. You get crevasses open up, which are these sort of giant cracks in the snow. And they can go down sort of 40 metres. But you also can't see them because you get a light dusting of snow on top. So you have to have a rope between each of you and you're sort of the anchor for the person in front and behind of you in case one of you falls down these crevasses. And we wanted to show people at home kind of the dangers and why these field guides have to be so skilled. So we kind of hiked along and they, were, they had this special uh, ground penetrating radar. It looked like, you know, American football players when they run with a tyre behind them. Yes, yes. For sort of fitness reasons. Yeah, it looked like that, but it's got the radar inside. And as it slides over the snow it's looking down to see where these cracks are and then they ah. can plot to make sure they put flags where the crevasses are. And then when we found a really big one, which they'd already dug the top off, we're like, right, how can we show people at home what this looks like? So uh, and, and at this stage, Mike, the cameraman, had, had to go on one of the boats because you only a small weather window. We thought, right, we need the pictures on the boat. You go and do that, Mike. I'll film the rest of it on my phone. So we went up there. I thought, right, we need to get this shot. So I had a 360 degree camera on a stick we duct taped it to a large bit of cable. Um, we got a bamboo pole and laid it across the crevasse. And then <laughs> with me lying on my front and the two field guys I was with stood at a distance. So they're kind of the anchors in case I fell. Oh, we Martin! forward and an army roll. And then we dangled the camera and a lantern. We'd also duct taped to a bit of string and lowered them into the crevasse so you could get a sense of this kind of going down, this abyss under... And they're huge. I mean, it's absolutely massive. If you fell down there, you would be in massive trouble. Presumably, really you'd good. filled in like the a... appropriate risk assessment before you left, did you, Martin? We've done, done a dynamic risk assessment on with trained professionals, Lucy, of course. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was, it was really cool. It was really cool. <laughs> right, Martin, thank you very, very much for yet again a super update. And hopefully I'll get to speak to you at least another time, uh, maybe even twice before you return to us. Keep safe to you and Look Mike and... Um, Keep up the fantastic work. Take care of yourselves. And we will be back, uh, undoubtedly, with Martin very soon. But in the meantime, you can catch up with all he is getting up to on board the RRS Sir David Attenborough. I find that difficult to say for some reason. That's all on our websites and our social media platforms. Thank you so much for listening. And whilst you're here, why don't you subscribe to What You Need to Know to stay up to date with our quick news briefings. You can listen or watch the podcast on YouTube, ITVX, or on your favourite podcast platform. Until next time, bye-bye for now.